Jesus, let your kingdom come here, let your will be done here in us. Jesus, there is no one greater, you alone our Savior. Show the world your love. King of heaven, come down. King of heaven, come down. Let your glory reign, shining like the day. King of heaven, come. King of heaven, rise up. Who can stand against us? strong to save in your mighty name King of heaven come we are children of your mercy rescue for your glory we cry Jesus set our hearts toward Let's uh, bow for a word of prayer. Uh, gracious Lord, thank you again that we can uh, be here in worship and praise of who you are and what you've done. And Lord, I pray that as we go through this time together, that God, our, our hearts, our minds are focused upon you and your goodness, your grace, your love, your mercy. 
but God, also the truth by which you lead and guide our lives. And God, I pray that we are open to your leading in all things, and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God. Savior all the day long. 
good morning to all my guests, friends, visitors, those watching online. Uh, hey, y'all. <laughs> How we doing? Look, look, all the men are looking at me like, hey, Pastor, as long as you get us done in time to go see the game, we all right with you today. See, I, I know, I know, I know where you are. See, come on, come on. So we've been in a series for the past few weeks, uh, walking through the book, line upon line, through 1 Peter. And so we're going to continue that um, today. Uh, I'm going to talk from the title, and you can put this up, Audrey. Uh, It's called An Attitude Adjustment. An Attitude Adjustment. Um, And it reminded me of two really, really bad jokes. It's kind of how we roll. Uh, (laughs) it, It says, what do you call an acid with a bad attitude? Amino acid, get it? Amino acid. I said it was bad before I told the joke, so I figured, like, i give you the buffer. Okay. There was this guy who was talking about he had his bed, and he said, my bed has a bit of an attitude problem. He said, I don't know what's going on. And he said, well, let me look at it. He says, oh, here's your problem. It's a Tempur-Pedic. Get it? Tempur-Pedic. Okay. Everybody's like, Pastor, could you just go to the scripture? Okay, I will, I will, I will. Sorry, sorry, I will, I will. We're, we're, we're talking about an attitude adjustment, and I, and I won't spill it too far because you'll see once we read this first section uh, of 1 Peter, we're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 4 today, um, you're going to see quickly what I'm talking about and why we called it this because there's this is great line here that kind of tells us how we should equip ourselves as we're going through. And so if you have your Bibles, your smart devices, turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 4. Uh, I'm going to read starting at verse number one, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to read through a section. We'll kind of stop, talk about it, then we'll finish another little section after that. And so 1 Peter uh, chapter four, uh, starting at verse number one is where we're going to be today. And I'm going to read it from the New Living Translation, but please feel free to follow along with whatever translation you have in front of you. Uh, We'll get to the same place. Amen? So 1 Peter chapter four, starting at verse number one, and for this first section, I'm going to read down to uh, verse number six. So 1 Peter 4, uh, 1, I think we have it, okay. 1 Peter 4, verse 1 says this. It says, so then, since Christ suffered physical pain, you must arm yourselves with the same attitude he had. Let's just, just see that right there. He says, arm yourselves with the same attitude he had and be ready to suffer too. For if you have suffered physically for Christ, you have finished with sin. You won't spend the rest of your lives chasing your own desires but you will be anxious to do the will of God. You have had enough in the past of the evil things that godless people enjoy, their immorality and lust, their feasting and drunkenness and wild parties, and their terrible worship of idols. Of course, your former friends are surprised when you no longer plunge into the flood of wild and destructive things they do, so they slander you. But remember that they will have to face God who stands ready to judge everyone, both the living and the dead. Verse 6. This is why the good news was preached to those who are now dead. So although they were destined to die like all people, they now live forever with God in the Spirit. So a couple things here. First, uh, it might seem weird wording there at the beginning where he talks about this idea of being finished with sin. And so I want to kind of explain that. Because when you read that uh, in verse 1, and Audrey, you can put verse 1 back up for a second. Look, don't let me screw up your stuff. (laughs) But in verse 1, he says this line there where he says, uh, for if you've suffered physically with Christ, you have finished with sin. That very last line there at the end. And this idea of being finished with sin, what he means is like you, you're done with it. Does that make sense? It didn't mean like you finished with sin. He's like, no, I'm finished with it. Like, like I'm done with it. Uh, uh, to use better words or to use different words, what he's saying is um, that we should get to a point where we're done with intentional sin and make a decision to stop pleasing ourselves and the world and intentionally living a life that's pleasing to God. So when I say I'm finished with it, it's like I'm done with it. Does that make sense? I'm, I'm done with doing those things that I've been doing. Uh, last week, if you think about what we talked about in the last section as we finished up chapter 3, uh, we looked at Hebrews 12. And the advice that was given there to rid ourselves of sin, remembering the things that so easily trip us up. And so we see this here. And, 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 and to kind of go, before we go any further, I want, I want to start with a question here, because if he's telling us that, okay, look, we have to be finished with this, and we're going to live for God, right? Then we have to live for him. And so here's the question. Is there something that you have allowed in your life that you sense it is time to put a stop to? I love asking questions like this because this is between you and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
No one says amen on this because they don't want to feel like I'm talking to you when I'm talking to all of us. Amen? <laughs> Is there something that we've allowed in, our, in your life that you sense it's time to put a stop to? Has the Holy Spirit continued to speak to you about an area or about an action? Or do you simply feel conflicted or grieved about something, but you still hadn't stopped doing it? If so, I'm here to challenge you to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. To do the very thing that you sense the Holy Spirit telling you to do. I got to tell you, when I, when I read the passage here, and, I, and I'm, I'm jumping around, but I'll just say, uh, the, the line there where it talks about your friends and continuing to do the things that they do, there came a point when I really said, okay, I'm going to try to follow God, but I was trying to still hang with my friends that I realized I couldn't do the same things that they were doing and enjoy it, more, enjoy it anymore like I used to. Something had changed on the inside, even though I still looked the same, even though I still had terrible jokes and all of that stuff, something was different inside of me, and I couldn't continue to do the same things I used to do and be okay with it. And although other people might not have known it, I was conflicted on the inside with what I was doing. And so in the same way, if you can understand that on me, let me turn the mirror to you and say, is there an area where you're still feeling conflicted about something in your life? And if so, what are you going to do about it? Peter's telling us here, listen, we, we have to be done with that stuff. We have to be finished with it. We have to do something different. When we look at this, that line that I highlighted when we were reading in verse, uh, verse number one was, he says, we should what? We should arm yourselves with the same attitude that Jesus had. It's a weird reading about that. Because what I think about is like, you know, like maybe the country western shows, and they say, arm yourselves, pow, pow, right? <laughs> like I'm arming myself. But what does he say arm myself with, right? Not an AR or whatever it is, right? Not, not, a, not a Uzi. He says, arm myself with the same attitude that Christ had. I'm arming myself with that. And so, so I did a little digging, and you can put that next slide up. To arm yourselves means you are prepared to face a struggle, resistance, or war. Right? You must be ready for people and the devil to come against you by equipping yourself with things that strengthen and protect you. So you're telling me by putting on the attitude of Christ can help to strengthen and protect me? Look, when I say that, some people's like, yeah, Pastor, I understand exactly what you're saying because you must have worked where I worked. <laughs> in an environment where I had to put on the whole armor of God to be able to make it in and out of this place every single day. We are to arm ourselves with the same attitude as Jesus, but y'all you, you, know how I am, right? I'm like, Pastor, that sounds good. I'm like, Peter, that sounds great, but what does that look like practically? It sounds good. It's like I'm armed with the, with the same attitude as Jesus. Okay, but I need you to, to break that down into pieces for me because I, I could say that and still not do that. So, you know, I got scripture for what we're going to look at today. So, so let's see. Peter tells us to arm ourselves, uh, 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 he tells us we should arm ourselves with the same attitude as Jesus, and so I want to show you uh, some scripture that, that gives us a breakdown of what that looks like. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. We'll come back to uh, 1 Peter in a second. But if he tells us we have to arm ourselves, and I'm going to start at verse number 3, if he tells us we have to arm ourselves with the same attitude that Christ had, well, let's look at what Paul tells us the attitude that Christ had, and let, let's make sure we are arming ourselves, or at least know what that should look like. Amen? First Peter, oh, sorry, first Peter, Philippians, <laughs> too many Ps. Philippians 2, uh, verse number 3. Philippians 2, I'm going to start at verse number 3, and I'm going to read it all the way down uh, in context to verse number 16. The, the main section that answers the question starts at verse number 5 and goes to about, I think, 11. But we're going to read the whole thing in context because it's just Look, it's just too many things for us to not miss when we see this. Look, some of y'all looking at the first question and already at the first verse and already groaning, but that's okay. Uh, look at this. So Philippians 2, 3, uh, and look at what Paul says here again. I'm reading from New Living. Follow along with what you have in front of you. He says this. He says, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Think of others as better than yourselves. Verse 4, don't look out only for your own interests. But take an interest in others too. Somebody said, well, we can stop there, Pastor. But no, there, <laughs> but wait, there's more. Look what he says in five. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Oh, so this is what we talked about in Peter, and now he's gonna tell us what that looks like. 
I'm going to read it all the way down uh, to, to, to yeah, 18 and we'll stop. But look at what he says in verse 6. He says, though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took on the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being when he appeared in human form. Verse 8, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Verse 9, therefore God elevated him to the highest place of honor and gave him the name above other names. Verse 10, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Dear friends, you've always followed my instructions when I was with you, and now that I'm away, even more important, and it is even more important. He says, work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear, for God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Look at verse 14, before you get mad at me, Paul wrote it, sending him your emails. It says, do everything without complaining and arguing. He said, everything without complaining and arguing. He says, so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Hold firmly to the word of God. Then on the day of Christ's return, I will be proud that I did not run the race in vain and that my work was not useless. But I will rejoice even if I lose my life, pouring it out like a, link, a liquid offering, or some translations say a drink offering to God. Just like your faithful service is an offering to God, and I want all of you to share that joy. And I'm going to stop here in verse 18. He says, yes, you should rejoice, and I will share your joy. Now, I want to highlight a couple of things, because I know that was a lot. <laughs> I read down uh, uh, further in there, because I wanted to give us the full context of where it was, not just a little piece. But if we're supposed to arm ourselves uh, with the same attitude that Jesus had, there's five things I want to lift from the passage, starting kind of from verse 5 to verse 11. Five things that he specifically said that Jesus had, and so we can think about these are things that we should be practically trying to apply to our lives. All right? Y'all ready? Okay, here, here we go. The first one, he said Jesus made himself of no reputation. Right? Jesus made himself of no reputation. If we were picking our life's trajectory and writing out the plan and choosing our position in the social rankings, most of us would not, se would not select the option at the bottom of the ladder label of no reputation. All right? We, 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 we wouldn't choose that, but that's what Jesus chose. We have to remember to have the mind of Christ so it cannot be about our reputation. It can't be about our vanity. It can't be about our glory because it shouldn't be about our glory, right? It should be about God getting the glory. This is not what we go after. We're not supposed to be celebrities making a name for ourselves. It has to be about living a life that points people to Jesus and sharing our Jesus story with other folks. What did Jesus do? He made himself of no reputation. If we're even honest and go deeper, God's the one who exalted him. So we shouldn't be spending all of our time, all of our energy, and all the gifts God has given us just to exalt ourselves. There's, there's a problem there. If we're going to take on the same attitude that he had, that was the first one. The second one, he took upon him the form of a servant. He took, he took upon him the form of a servant. Jesus was not forced to be a servant, and it was not the only option he had. His mindset caused him to take on this idea or this form of a servant and to actually choose that. Despite what others in the world do or believe, greatness is not about power, it's not about position, it is not about authority. Greatness is not about power, it's not about position, it is not about authority. Or at least that's not how Jesus sees it, right? If someone wants to be great, he or she must be a servant. We must fulfill God's will rather than our own agenda. We'll just let that sit there for a second. We're called to serve. We're called to be a servant. If we're going to take on that attitude that he have, we have to serve other people. Number three, 
He was made in the likeness of men. And sometimes when we look at that, it's like, well, what do you mean? So Jesus chose to walk around in a physical body like us. Again, in heaven, there's no pain. There's no crying. There's no sadness. There's none of those things, right? None of the negative things that we have. And he chose to walk around in a body like us. He did it to be our example of what we could get accomplished. And here's the point about this. No matter how high you think you are, we have to be willing to do, be, and go according to what God has purposed for our lives. We got to be able to go and do whatever that is that God has called us to do despite the experience. And what's interesting about that is Peter's already wrote this whole letter about us having to suffer for doing good, which we talked about last week, about some of the storms that we're going to face. And then think about this idea now of us having the attitude of Christ. That means that, okay, as a man with an earth suit or a woman, you know what I mean, with an earth suit here on this earth and living this life, despite what comes out, can we still walk through this with the same attitude that he had? Because that's what we're called to do. Number four. Jesus, what did he do? He humbled himself. He he humbled himself. To humble yourself is to bring yourself down, and Jesus demonstrated this for us. So many focused on being seen, (laughs) celebrated, and and being great in men's eyes, but we should strive to be used by God and to make our Heavenly Father proud. The greatest is not the one with the highest position, it's not the one with the best seat, right? That, that, that's, that's, not, that's not who's considered the greatest. It's not the one with the biggest title, right? That, that, that's not who's the greatest. The greatest is the one who humbles himself or herself to serve. And you say, well, Pastor, you said that twice. Well, wait, 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 what do you got? I got, I got scripture for it, Matthew 23, 11 and 12. Jesus himself, he says that the greatest among you shall be a servant, and we have to be willing to serve others and not be concerned about our status. When Jesus was with the tax collectors at dinner and with the other sinners, he wasn't worried about his reputation, right? Because they criticized him for doing it. And what did he say? He was about the business and the reason that his father sent him. And so should we be. Number five. The last thing that we learn about the attitude that Jesus has is this. He became obedient unto death, even the death on a cross. Jesus had the attitude that no matter how I want, no matter what I want, no matter how I feel, or no matter how I think, I will do God's will for my life. Even if that leads to death. That's that's a that's a difficult and a tough word. Especially if we say, wait, he's our example. So it didn't matter what he thought, what he felt, or what he, because again, you say, well, what do you mean, Pastor? I think about my, my, my immediate thought goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, where he was like, you know, God, if there's any way somebody else could do this, <laughs> that I don't have to go through this, please, he said, but nonetheless, if this is your will, I'll do it. And as I say that, I realize there's people listening to me now in this room, there's people listening to me online who are going to say, yeah, but Pastor, I don't want to have to do this. I get what you don't want to have to do, but if you're sensing God's telling you you have to do it, it's not a sin to not want to do it, but it's a sin not to do it. You say, why do you say that? Because Jesus didn't want to do it. He was like, now God, I know you're God, and I'm not trying to tell you what to do, but if there's any way, right? But he still submitted to what he sensed God telling him to do, and I believe the same is true for us. I know when we think about this idea of him doing it and being obedient unto death, right? It seems extreme. Maybe for some people it seems scary. But to know that even death has no sting compared to going to heaven and where we're going to spend our eternity has to give us confidence that even if it means that, it's okay. Even if that's where the road leads, it's going to be okay. We have to have the attitude and the mindset that we will accomplish all that we sense God telling us to do And it doesn't matter what other people say or think. Our job is to please God with our lives and to serve him faithfully. That's what we're called to do, and that's who we have to be. Y'all are so serious today. Holy Spirit's talking to y'all about some stuff, okay? 
I'm just going to stick to my little notes. Can you, can you go back to 1 Peter now? We're going to go back to 1 Peter and finish that up. Go back to 1 Peter. So, so that's the attitude we have to have, right? That, 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 that's this, this mindset that we have to have if we're going to be like him. He says, arms ourselves with that. And what I love about that is if we're arming ourselves with that, then that means that by having that type of attitude, we're going to defeat and overcome different things that are going to come at us. By arming ourselves and equipping ourselves with that type of mindset that Jesus has. So back to 1 Peter 4, I'm going to read verse 7 and 8. So I'll give you a second. 1 Peter 4, go back to verses 7 and 8. And 7 and 8, look at what he says here. He says, the end of the world is coming soon. Therefore, be earnest and disciplined in your prayers. Most importantly of all, continue to show deep love for each other, for love covers a multitude of sins. Uh, Verse 7 provides me with the opportunity to ask you, how is your prayer life? How's your prayer life? When, when we look at verse 7 here, I, I love that. He says, therefore, be earnest and disciplined in your prayers. Uh, some other uh, translations talk about being intentional in your prayers, about praying for other people. Um, the thing I want you to notice when we look at verse 7, Audrey, go to verse 7 again for me, and then we'll, we'll go to 8. Go back to verse 7 just so they can see it. The thing I want you to notice about verse 7 is the sense of urgency that's implied here. Because I want you to think about it this way. He's saying the end of the world is coming soon, right? The end of the world is coming soon, so I'm going to give you the most important things I think you should be doing. So what does he say are the most important things? One, he says the end of the world world is coming soon, so here's two things. You need to be intentional and disciplined about prayer and also walking in love with one another. He talks about prayer here, and then in verse 8, he talks about loving one another. Think of that. He says, if if these are the two things that I need you to walk away with, one is you got to be intentional about your prayer, and two, you need to be walking in love with each other. You heard me say a bunch of times that we're never going to grow to the point in our spiritual walk that we don't have to walk in love, right? Everything hinges on this idea of us walking in love, right? we'll, We'll never get past being able to walk in love with other people. But I think there's something about this idea of prayer here. With prayer, we're staying connected to God, and it should be both us submitting our request to God, but also us being able to hear from God. And so as we're going out doing the things that we need to do, uh, um, what I loved about the word that's translated earnest here is this idea of being able to be vulnerable and open with God. Being heartfelt and true to some degree is what what that word is breaking down to when you look it up. And I wonder... When it comes to our prayers, because there's, there, there's something about us, you know, we pray for other people and all of that stuff, but are there places where we need to be open and vulnerable and like, like, as if God doesn't know? <laughs> but in the area of our prayer life, are, are we afraid sometimes to even ask for the thing that we need help with? It's earnest and discipline. I love that discipline, discipline please, because we got to be Intentional. And we got to pray not just when things are going bad, right? Because, you know, in the midst of storms, nobody has to remind you to pray, right? Or maybe that's just me. When things are going bad, I, you know, we don't miss prayer, right? <laughs> but when it's going good, we should still be disciplined enough to still pray to God, to still communicate to God, to still walk that out even when things are going well. Discipline. <sighs> when I think about this phrasing here in verse 8, and Audrey, you, Audrey, you can turn it to verse 8. Uh, one of the things that sticks out to me uh, is this imagery where he says, most of all, uh, continue to show deep love for each other, for love covers, covers a multitude of sins. I think about the, the emotional bank account, this imagery of like an emotional bank account that we have, right? And so if you, if you think about a, a bank account, uh, what happens when you try to withdraw more money than what's in the account, like a regular bank account, right? It gets overdrawn right? You say you might need to overdraft people to come help you out, right? Overdraft protection, whatever. It gets overdrawn. And in the same way, it's almost like if we're showing deep love, we're making deposits in each other's emotional bank account. So that at points where we need to make withdrawals, we've already put something in. Would you say, well, Pastor, that's good, right? But then here's the thing about this. If you think about it, even if someone tries to make a withdrawal from us, and they hadn't made a deposit, because we're followers of Christ, it's almost like God, it's like, like Jesus said, look, I'm going to put my love 
in your account to the full, almost like overdraft protection. So even if love is required and somebody didn't make a deposit there, I've got enough to cover what needs to be in there, so therefore you can walk in love with them. You can walk in forgiveness with them. You're like, yeah, but pastor, but they didn't, they didn't pour into me, so why should I give them? No, 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 no. I've, I've covered it. I, I, I've given you enough to be able to do it. Th- that's just imagery I, I, I see here. And so our mindset has to be that every time someone tries to overdraft from our emotional bank account, we remember that Jesus already paid the price and the debt is covered. Not because that person or what they did was good, but because God is good. That's how we walk in love with them. You say, because how can love cover a multitude of sins? Okay, uh, uh, that, that's how it covered it, because Jesus paid the price. He paid the price for it. So we freely and willingly extend it to them. Let's go to verse number 9. And I'm going to read uh, ah, 9 through 11. I'll read, this finishes the part where we're going to cover today. 9 through 11, look at this. So in 9, the very next part here, look at this. He's talking about love, and he goes here, he says, cheerfully share your home with those who need a meal or a place to stay. Verse 10, God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. In verse 11, do you have the gift of speaking? Then speak as though God himself were speaking through you. Do you have the gift, do you have the gift of helping others? Do it with all the strength and energy that God supplies. Then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. All glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. I love this little part here at the end. I love it because Peter, uh, uh, as, as pastors would say, informs some and reminds others that God is giving you a gift. God has given you gifts that are supposed to be used to serve other people. So let's try it. On the count of three, everybody say amen. One, two, three, amen. <laughs> Our abilities should be faithfully used in serving others and not only for our exclusive personal enjoyment. That's what he says. Our gifts were used, should be used to serve other people. And so now I get to ask you a question. The question is this. <laughs> How are you using the gifts that God has given you? Are you the only person benefiting from the gifts that God has given you? And here's the thing. If you don't know what you should be doing, right? Because somebody says, well, Pastor, maybe I have these gifts, and I I don't know how I'm supposed to use this. Um, I'll give you two practical actions that you can take. All right, there's two practical things that you can do. One, ask God in prayer, God, where do you want me to use these gifts you've given me? And here's the secret. It won't just be in church. God, where can you use me to to use these gifts that you've given me? How could I use my story to help someone else? How could I use what you've given me with these hands, with my brain, with my skill set, whatever it is, how can I use that to help someone else? Ask God first. First thing. Second thing, again, practical. Come have a conversation with pastor or any one of us on our leadership team to be able to help you. Let's talk it out. A part of our job is to help equip the saints. Look, as I say that, the leadership team is like, no, go talk to the pastor. Don't come bring him to me, look. (laughs) If Ephesians 4 is true about the five-fold ministry, a part of our job is to help equip people to use their gifts to serve God well and to serve other people. And I am convinced that every single person listening to me right now has something that God can use for his glory. You have a gifting that that, that can be used. I, I think about all the stuff, even just over the past 12 months that we've done as a church, even as simple as letter writing. Remember we did letter writing? What was that last year? We sat down one day and had uh, box lunches or whatever and just wrote letters of encouragement to one another and to other people. As simple as they may seem, there's something all of us can do. And so how are you using your gifts? Even as you seek to discover your gifts, If you see a need in church, seek to meet it. There's plenty of opportunities where where someone will say, man, I see this is an area 
that maybe needs some help, needs some work or whatever, and maybe the reason you see it is because God's giving you the gifts to be able to meet the need there. And I know when I say that, it sounds self-serving because I'm the pastor, right? i like, well, pastor, you would say that, but it, but it is true. It is true. There, there are examples that, that, that what I realize is uh, for years there were certain things that I realized were a burden to me and they weren't a burden to everybody else. It stirred my passions, and what I realized was God had given me the, the gifting. And I'm talking about before I was in ministry and all that, just a guy going to church. He put the burden on me, and he had equipped me to be able to solve the issue. And so will you be willing, if you find those areas where the Holy Spirit is, like, putting it on your heart, like, man, something needs to be done in this area, and maybe you're the someone that needs to do it. Amen. <sighs> In verse 9, uh, it says this. It tells us to cheerfully share your home with someone who needs a meal or a place to stay. And one takeaway outside of the obvious of being able to use what God's given us to be a blessing to others is the idea that we're supposed to serve or be used by God cheerfully. Again, we talked about the title was an attitude adjustment, right? Uh, uh, and, and so... Uh, our attitude when we serve other people matters. It matters how we serve, right? It matters how we do that. In addition, uh, I think the principle here is that we are stewards or managers of what God is giving us. And if God puts on your heart to serve others with what he's giving you, each of us should be willing, and here it is, cheerfully open to doing it. We're not owners of the stuff that we have. We're just stewards or managers. And if God said, hey, I've given you this, and I want you to bless somebody with it, who are we? Oh, okay, you, you know. And here's the rub. When we think about this idea of using our gifts, when we think about how God can use us to, be, to serve other people, we have to now look at our lives with uh, an honest lens and wonder, are we using our gifts to serve the world more than to serve God? It, I'm just saying. And, and again, let, let me, because I, I know sometimes when we talk or when a pastor speaks, it's like Christianese is what is heard. When I say that, I'm not talking about just serving God in church. Does that make sense? Because sometimes we hear that's like, oh, pastor's saying we got to just serve in church. Yeah, I want you to serve in church, but more so, if we are light and we're supposed to go out in the, amongst the darkness and have an impact, you're going to have much more impact outside instead of just in here with other light. You understand? And so do I want you to serve here? Absolutely. But more so, when you leave this place and you go through your week, you're going to be around other people who aren't light. And we should be using our gifts, looking for opportunities where God to use us. He has us uh, strategically placed to be able to be used. And I don't want us to say, well, I, I served on Sunday, so that should be enough. No, it's, it's a lifestyle. It, it is who we are. And so we got to ask ourselves, am I, am I doing all this work? And, I, and I'm, 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 I'm using my, my, my gifts and talents here, but I'm really not using it to serve other people. I want to turn to one last little cross-reference before we wrap. Uh, can you turn to Romans 12 for me? Romans 12, verse 6. One last little cross-reference. I love this. Uh, it's Romans 12, 6, if I didn't say that. Romans 12, 6. I love this because it looks like Peter and Paul wrote the same exact words. And so I like to show it to you in, in multiple places sometimes because it's like, you say, well, Peter said that, but what about anybody? No, Paul said the same thing. So Romans 12, verse 6, look at what he says. I'm going to read 6, 7, and 8. Paul says this, he says, in his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them how? Well. If you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, uh, if it, if it is giving give generously. If God has given you a leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. It almost sounds like cheerfully, right? 
It's almost like they're writing the same words in the same Bible. And at some point, we have to take those things and make sure we do them. I say all that that leads to just my final three points for today. Um, The first one is this. What are your gifts and how can God use them to serve, uh, how can God use you to serve others with them? You need to answer that question for yourself. You need to look at what he's given you, what he's placed in your hand, what he's equipped you with, time, talent, treasure. How can I use the gifts God has given me uh, uh, to serve others? How can God use it? Not just pastor, not just, no, no. How can God use your gifts to be, uh, to be able to serve other people? Because you look at it, that's why we got them, right? That's the first point. The second one is this. Uh, are you being intentional and disciplined in your prayer life? Are you being intentional and disciplined in your prayer life? If not, it's time to start. Again, the, the, the point is not to, to beat up on you if you say, well, Pastor, I hadn't really done that. I hadn't even thought about that. That's fine. Start now. Start now. And the last one is this. Make sure you arm yourself with the same attitude that Jesus had as you go forward and do what God has for you to do. So now we got a picture of what that looks like, right? It's not enough to say, okay, I'm going to arm myself, you know, I'm going to take on the whole armor of Christ, uh, and we don't really know what that is, you know, Ephesians 6, but you know, yeah, we might not know what that is. So now, now you have a blueprint, right? No reputation, am I humbling myself? We, we, got, we got kind of a blueprint of what that looks like, and as we go forward, this is what we need to do. So, as y'all continue writing, if you're here today, and you've never made the decision to believe, to make Jesus Lord of your life, this is really the starting point. Accepting him as your Lord and Savior is the key to doing what he's called you to do. If you try to do all of these things we're talking about based on willpower, based on positive affirmations or whatever, it's going to fall short. You need the power of God working through you. When we read in that Philippians 2, when we got to verse 13, it says, it is, it, is God that, 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 uh, it is God in you that wills and does according to his good pleasure. And so we recognize that uh, a part of us being able to do the things that God has called us to do to fulfill the assignments that he has is by having a personal relationship with him, by accepting him as Lord over our life. And so there's kind of two parts there, right? There's the one part of being able to do the things that you've been called to do in this lifetime, but there's also the part of when you die going to heaven, The only way you get there is by placing your faith in Jesus. And what do we believe? We believe that Jesus really did live. He walked on this earth. He died on the cross for our sins to pay the penalty. He was buried for three days. He rose again and is now sitting at the right hand of the Father. And what we believe is by you believing in that, believing in your heart, confessing with your mouth, is how you get saved. Does it make you, uh, uh, remove you from facing storms and difficulties? Absolutely not. But by making that decision, it secures your spot in heaven and now gets access to you to be able to go forward and do all the things that God has called you to do, piece by piece, as he continues to make you more and more like him. And if you can't say, man, I've made that decision that I know that if I were to die here in the next few minutes, I would go to be with God in heaven. Listen, you have to make that decision. Everyone has to make that decision for themselves. And so in a little bit, we're going to stand and we're going to sing. Our prayer counselors are going to come down. If you need to make that decision, please, ma'am, please, sir, I'm going to ask you to come down and get saved if you haven't. I always like to say that if you get saved, if, if I never see you again, I will see you again one day. It's the first thing. Second thing is what we call rededication. Rededication is for those who say, well, Pastor, I've already made that decision to place my faith in Jesus, right? I, I, I've done that, but if I look at my life, I'm not living the life that I should be living. Maybe there's been uh, uh, bad decisions. Maybe there's been hurt. Maybe there's been trauma. Maybe there's been loss. There's something that's just pushed me away from, from what I know I should be doing. Maybe there's just been mistakes or whatever. And the good news is that God loves you. God has a never-failing, undying love for you, and God's not mad at you. And so at any point, what he tells us to do is to repent and to keep going. Jesus didn't die on the cross. He didn't do all this stuff and pour everything into you for you to stop here, for you to quit. And so it is time for us to get up, if that is you, and keep going. Repent and turn away from those things, and let's go, let's go forward and let's chase after God and do all the stuff that he has for us.
And so if that is you, you say, yeah, Pastor, I'd love to rededicate and recommit myself to the things of God. We'd love to walk you through that process. Same thing. When we stand up and pray in the prayer councils, they hear, come down and have a conversation with someone, and they'll walk you through what that looks like of, of praying a prayer of rededication. Third is prayer. If you need prayer for anything, there's nothing too small, there's nothing too large. We count it a privilege and a joy to be able to pray with you and add our, our prayers of agreement and add our faith with you for things that you need prayer for. And so if you need prayer, don't leave this place and not get prayed for. And last and certainly not least, if God's called you to be a part of this church, here's what you need to know. Uh, one of the things we strive to do is to teach the Word of God in a simple and uncomplicated way so you can understand it and then go live it. Second, we get busy in our community because we believe that's what the Bible tells us to do. And third, we're a church made up of people from different backgrounds, different origin stories, like I like to say. Um, and God's brought us here to do what? Use our gifts and talents. To bring those gifts and talents here to be used to make a difference in this place, but beyond these walls as well. And so if you're like, man, I'd love to be a part of it, we would love to have you. And so there's four things. If you need to get saved, if you need to rededicate, if you need uh, prayer, or if you want to join this church, uh, here's what I want you to do. If, if you're able to stand where you are, can you stand for a moment just where you're sitting? And as the, the team and the prayer counselors come on and get in position, um, if you need to respond to one of those four things, please, ma'am, please, sir, come and respond right now. Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my strength, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm.